program is in the worst possible taste. Before I'm finished, they'll take this rubbish off. They've got to listen to me. And you know why? Because I represent the silent majority! <laughs> <laughs> Bing, 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 her butler stands by with a gleam in his eye and pops them back in with warm spoons. We are not amused. <laughs> Your Majesty. <laughs> now that was funny. <laughs> I can't believe I heard it. That's second thoughts. I'm not so sure. I think I'll stay for more. I can understand the orthodox way of defining a comedian. Where did Everett fit in? Probably nowhere. He fitted in his own space and he was just... He was just brilliant. First and foremost, he was a disc jockey. And everything sprang from the fact that he was involved in popular music. He used to play everything for everybody so that if you sat and listened to his programme, you'd you'd get the drift of what was happening musically in the country. So he had a great love for musicians and obviously for people like myself, who he's, whose records he'd played often. Uh, the Bee Gees, I remember the Bee Gees. Take one pill from bottle A. Good. <laughs> <laughs> the shirt open to the navel, exposing hairy chest and revealing large golden medallion pill. Or as I call it, bottle B. Ah, he's got the right bottle this time. <laughs> well done, little chap. <laughs> Stage three, bottle C. You'll be needing the world famous BG hair. <laughs> oh, God, look at you. Yes, not bad. But there's something missing. You're only one, and there should be three. Take bottle D. The world famous vibrato. Will you all pick up the vibrato bottles and keep taking the pills until the required wobble is achieved? I first met Kenny on board MV Galaxy, which was Radio London, in December of 65. And we had just gone out on one of the roughest passages in this very old rusty tub that they called a tender. And I was getting very ill. And we got on board the ship from the tender, and I went into the mess area. And there was this little fella huddled in the corner, and I could tell immediately he was as sick as I was. And he said, you must be Dave Cash. Well, I'm Morris Cole. Well, I'm Kenny Everett, actually. When he joined Radio London uh, as a pirate disc jockey, they had to change their names for legal reasons. So Kenny adopted the name of Edward Everett Horton, who was an American comedy film actor. And he took the Everett part, and then he decided on Kenny because he said it sounded so warm and cuddly. Wonderful radio, London. Oh, you do it so beautifully, but you do it. You're listening to Kenny and Cash on London. So don't forget, just name the Beatles songs that we played within the last half hour. You can win yourself. Help! Albums for nothing. You can also win Dave Cash if you try hard enough. I'm trying to get rid of him, I tell you. We have the weather. Okay, but uh, we got ten seconds to go. You know, we want to give it real spot-on weather time. Okay. Oh, gosh. What do you think this is? The biscuit company or something? British biscuit company. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the time is exactly six. O'clock. We knew that the pirate station's life was limited. And then all of a sudden, Radio 1 was going to start. 
Turn on the radio every day, how simply wonderful. Hooray, 247 is where you'll see music and laughter, BBC. So when you're down feeling awfully low, here's what to do to make your blues just go. Open the pages of your radio times and turn on the radio and groove your blues away. I was there for the beginning of Radio 1. Uh, I was part of that famous photograph on the steps of the church opposite Broadcasting House. And he, he was on the weekends and getting huge audiences because those were the days of the huge audiences. National radio, we'd no opposition. They'd stamped out the pirates. And, you know, a, a 10 million audience was not unremarkable for radio. And Ken used to get that. He loved the goons, absolutely adored the goons. And we would spend hours just listening and listening and listening. Excuse me, sir. Yes, what is Basement it? Basement Billy, huh? I know, I yeah. just wants to know if yeah. you want any revive for revives. Why? Because I'm going down to the basement. Oh, good. In amongst the filth and the muck. muck. Oh. To dig you some heart. Oh, good. Right? Right. right. What a oh, mess you well, are. Me... He was the start, if you like, of the non-disc jockey, of uh, the subversive disc jockey. And to somebody who was interested in radio, um, as I say, this was a revelation to me, and, and I thought, well, here's something to build on. I, I just thought that he was amazing, and, and in a sense, it sounds pretentious to say this, but he was a genius of his kind. He was almost like a... I mean, he, if disc jockeys were dot to dot, he was Renoir. It's colouring time. You've all got the crayons we sent you, and you've been paying attention to the colours here on the set. OK, now we take all the colour away and leave you at the outlines. Remember the colours? Got them? Now, colour your screens and mail your TV to me in time for part two. You could win a week in Epping Forest and all the wood you can eat. Start colouring now. Um, Kenny Everett, born Liverpool, 1944, son of a tugboat captain, entered showbiz by accident. Big accident. He'd tell me um, how he started. He'd say that he had a, a wooden tape recorder. He said, and he'd make um, he'd make his tapes and cycle off, and and post things up to the BBC. And he when when he when he was a child, he said he came to London and stood at the gates of the BBC Television Centre, and looked through the gates at the building and thought, one day I'll be here. We used to go to places right up on the Yorkshire Moors in the Derbyshire Peak District. Exmoor, Dartmoor, away from crowds, because he actually was, hasn't come out anywhere else. He loved the countryside, the moorlands, and he would actually, if he saw a beautiful valley, we'd come out over a hill, so he would, he would often sort of speak to God. He would say, "Well, that's brilliant, God." He said, "I'm going to give you nine out of ten for that scene." Oh look, there's God. I think the thing that he disguised the most was this deep-rooted spirituality. I mean, he, he, he was a Roman Catholic to begin with, and uh, he was always cursing and, and mucking about with God and religion. But it was interesting that at the very end he came back. And all the time, I felt that he was actually a very religious person. <laughs> Please let this show go okay With no major boobs or goofs And without accidentally saying a rude word Like knickers or bum <laughs> Are you listening? No, I'm watching ITV Thank you very much But I'm taping you I could take something that was very serious and turn it round and make it funny. And of course, that was what got him into so much trouble all the way through his life, because he would just try and ease the pressure. Let's not get too serious. I remember once he was talking to, um, I think it was Father Oliver McTurnan, who was one of our uh, clergy who used to do the thing, uh, the Sunday moment of thought, that sort of business. And uh, Father turned up in, in the gear, and Kenny just said, uh, oh, he said, he said, all those gowns, the mitres, oh, it's gorgeous. He said, the church is the fashion show for fags. Like this, to being very camp. And Oliver McTurnan, who isn't, was not amused. You know, <laughs> <And> he just, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So he was always putting himself into hot water. But you had to say, listen, you know, it's just him. Don't worry about it. 
He'd put his mouth in gear before his brain in motion, you know. Why were you sacked from Radio 1? Oh, blimey, I'll have to run through a past catalogue of horror. Um, so, oh, it, yeah, it was for insulting some politician. That's right, the, 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 pro, oh, the transport minister's wife, that was it. She passed her test first time, and I thought that was a bit odd, the transport minister's wife. So I said that she would probably crammed a fiver in his hand, and that didn't go down too well, and they asked me to leave. In fact, they insisted upon it. Mm, I think that proves that life can't be all fun. People within the corporation just could not understand this new type of presenter. They were used to the very, very proper radio presenters. And for someone to be as anarchic as ever it was in those days was totally alien to them. And he was just having fun. He, there was no malice in the man. There wasn't an ounce of malice in the man. He was a creature of the technology. or well, the technology was his creature, if you like. Uh, I, I wouldn't work with tapes because I wouldn't have the dexterity or the ability to do it. But he worked it and worked off it. And I was actually talking to some of the boys in the BBC who had worked with them as, as engineers with this, with this programme in mind and saying, well, what was he like to work with as an engineer, as a technician? And they said he was very within himself, that he, 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 he wasn't a great um, conversationalist. He wasn't, he wasn't one who did 45 minutes in the bar and then, <laughs> and then another 45 minutes in front of the microphone. That wasn't his way. He was contained and introverted. But then, once the old green light went on, he became a gibbering maniac. This is where I come alive. I'm a drag outside the building, but in here, the hell world is my oyster. Today, the BBC. Tomorrow, ITV, if they love me. <laughs> Hello, Sid not here once again. You know, I was in my favourite supermarket the other day, breaking up a few shelves. <laughs> and suddenly, lo and behold, I saw on a shelf, action yob. <laughs> I mean, I knew I was famous, but I mean, golly, you know. I looked at the ingredients on the back of the packet, <laughs> and it said, it said, just wind up. And it natcha. <laughs> oh. 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 He never ever went out of fashion. I think from the very early days of radio, all the people that listened to him when he was on the pirate ships then followed his career throughout, whether it was the BBC, Capital, all the television he did. The fans were constant and he picked them up as he went. No, don't be afraid, my dear. It's only me, Cuddly Ken the most successful characters was his DIY man when he put a brown overall on and was this totally useless DIY man who would show viewers how to build a bookcase and end up missing fingers, bits of his arms, blood forever. But the young kids thought he was just wonderful. And they would write from the schools, a whole class of kids would write and say, Oh, we love the DIY man. He's our favourite character. Just before we start, I'd like to say a few words about looking after your tools. A dirty tool is no use to anybody. <laughs> They've got to be in the right place and clean and sharp, like our old mate, the crosscut saw. He likes to live down here, and I've really had a go at sharpening him today. <laughs> we were criticised for violent elements in our comedy, and I think Ev himself said the wisest words. He said, a bucket of blood is funny, a trickle of blood is nasty and worrying. So we had the inept handyman, Reg uh, Prescott, who w would operate a saw towards the camera, and the camera would move up so you didn't see what was happening, but you knew his other hand was in the way, and horrific things would ensue. Let's call this door here number one. <laughs> As you can see, I've marked out the shape. I will be cutting. It will be cutting. Right. Here. I will put the cutter on the edge here, right? Here we'll grab the wood with this hand. And we'll start off by cutting down the line, making sure we have the wood nice and steady. <laughs> yeah. 
we were great believers in over the topness rather than insidious creeping in of elements and everything. We could have been wrong, but uh, most people seem to enjoy it. It was a, a form of Grand Guignol slapstick, I think, to be pompous about it. They showed us some figures. Uh, they broke down the audience in relation to age groups. And they said that 40% uh, of the audience is between 20 and 45. And 27% of the audience is between 6 and 12. Which is really weird, isn't it? And, then, and so the BBC now, the board, say, are saying, wait a minute, there's 27% of the audience is kids. This is a kiddish show here. We can't do all this filth. And they say, but the kids love it. They don't think it's filth. And they, they, plus, the other forty percent are watching. They're not kids. Um, but it must be more for children. But the children are watching. It, the equation goes crazy, just because of the numbers. And we're not trying to write for children. It's Kenny's got this appeal for children. Please fasten your seatbelts and extinguish all cigarettes. Thank you. Captain, Captain Crimmon. Crimmon. By the look on that banana's face, Doc, mm? I'd say it liked Carla. Hmm, I think Carla likes the banana. Quick, Captain, oh, it's know. reaching down to her. Quick, Doc, home in on Carla and pick her up. Yeah, man, Captain! With a soul-tearing groan, the banana finally keeled over and fell headlong into the Hudson. Oh, that's another nasty situation neatly tucked away, Carla. Yeah, you've saved the world again. Mm, our secret code was uh, bananas because um, they were the most, well, we considered them to be the most naturally perfect thing God had created. It was a happy, smile-shaped fruit in yellow, and something that was good for you, and something that just looked happy. And uh, we'd send one another bananas. And he used to like doing tapestry. But it was, um, it was the, the, the hobby of kings. It wasn't an innie thing to do. <laughs> and um, he had tapestried it <laughs> and the thing is there's a little bit here at the end which he um, said he didn't want to finish he didn't want to take that line right to the top because he said he felt if he did that then he'd never see me again so he's left it unfinished which I'm glad about I think when I'm out and about with Cleo you know the woman on my show um, we laugh a lot and we don't seem to stop as soon as we meet, we start smiling and then we start laughing and we're helpless until night time comes. Kenny and I would speak for hours of how wonderful it was that we were able to meet on this planet <laughs> because he, um, he, did, he felt in a healthy way alien and, and so did I. What we really want is some bizarre people. Well, there is one frightening thing I do. Oh, what's that? My head blows up. <laughs> I don't know. It's the first time I've done it, and I, I didn't like it much. You know, you take over it, or you, or you leave over it. You can't, you can't really take bits of him and leave other bits out. I mean, you like some bits more than other bits, but um, you, you have to take him as an entity, I think, and that's what makes him a major entertainer. Well, that's the end of part one, and what a hot show it's been, full of hot items. So now it's time for a bit of liquid refreshment. Why not join me in a cup of tea? <laughs> no sugar! <laughs> Here come the ads, so take it away! Oh, not like that! Oh, must I do everything myself? All clogged up. Is your nose Gilbert City? <laughs> Try Naso Floss for that instant relief. <laughs> Naso Floss. To buy everything they tell you in the adverts, and I'll see you in a couple of minutes, all right? <laughs> Yee-haw! Big Mike's dead. <laughs> all of Kenny's characters were high concepts. You knew exactly who they were, and, and that's what was good about them. Oh, God. I'll guess of puke. <laughs> My God, this parish. Here's a joke. <laughs> this real pub, Dad's 24 pints of lager, 
and he's 18 packets of peanuts. Didn't bother him a bit. By Joe, on the way home, he pebble dashed two houses. <laughs> my mummy says that I could grow up to be just like my dad. I said, does that mean I've got to sleep with the woman next door? <laughs> Yes, Michael, that's true. I know there were only three musketeers, and they were never in Africa, but I think basically, don't you, that the film works on its own terms. I had a wonderful time making it with the pygmies. You know, those, those people, those people are really nice. All those little ones make such a change. You know, they had such small parts, but they really tried hard. Her full name, which the Radio Times asked us for at one point, was Cupid Stunt says he enunciating very carefully. And I remember Michael Parkinson had Cupid on the show and did actually ask me what her full name was. He said, I don't feel I can introduce her as Cupid. She's not, well, he didn't say Madonna in those days, but she's, she's not really like, I want to introduce her with an actress name. And he said, what's her full name? And I said, Cupid Stunt. I will not repeat Michael's reply, but he went away and rehearsed the, the name very carefully. Bert and I do this amazing scene where we're both naked in a helicopter and we're trapped with this axe murderer with a chainsaw. And Bert has this full frontal scene and the guy comes at him with the chainsaw and the helicopter's filling with blood and Bert's shouting, I can't find it, I can't find it! And suddenly the village is there and, oh, I'm telling you, the plot! Anyway, that's just the opening. And of course, it's all done in the best possible taste. <laughs> that's not funny at all. He enjoyed all his characters. There wasn't anything he disliked. And I think the way that he played all his characters showed that he could take anyone, any style of person, and, and bring a realness to them and the humor so from Cupid Stunt to Sid Snot to Gizzard Puke, uh, Kenny made those people real and funny. The mooted uh, name for the rocker bedecked in black leather, Ray and Kenny came up with Sid Snot. And I uh, very sniffily and pompously said, we can do better than that, that is terrible. And we had one of our rare disagreements. They lined up against me two to one and said, he's called Sid Snot. And I came up with other names, which I can't remember now. They're been erased from my memory, which I thought were wittier. Nope, Sid Snot it was, and that seemed to catch on. So I just backed off gracefully and said, all right. <laughs> I still think it's a terrible name. <laughs> I do have. So this snail is going across the lawn on a beautiful summer morning, sunshine, and birds are singing everywhere, and he feels great. He thinks to himself, life really is worth living. And he's so happy, he starts to sing. Shon, son, da moa, and the lawnmower goes rat ta 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 ta. Hello, my little Cox's orange patterns. You know, I was with a young lady the other night, tete a tete, and I said to her, Am I the first man you have ever loved? And she said, I don't know, were you in Marseille in 1962? <laughs> Au revoir, my little King Edwards. The gallery of characters soon built up. We wanted a heavily accented French character who wasn't Clouseau, but was something individual. And I think it was Kenny himself who came up with the idea of the rubber jaw for Marcel Wave. It was the only character in which he concealed his beard because he fancied the idea of having a curly moustache and no beard. So he did all that, uh, my little courgettes and everything with this ridiculous rubber chin on. And then the last one we ever did, he wrenched the rubber chin <laughs> off his face, crying, It was me all the time. It was as if there'd been a great illusion. He liked complexity, he liked technicalities. And indeed his jokes on, on radio and his jokes on television were based on technicalities, not necessarily wordplay. 
most comedians that I know would kill for the final laugh. And if you get one laugh more than them, they would cheerfully strangle you. If they had a Stanley knife, they'd stick it in you. But um, he wasn't like that. He was generous. He was an open-hearted performer. He allowed you room uh, to make a complete fool of yourself. <laughs> B-U-M? That must be Broadcasting Under Manager. No, it's a bomb. <laughs> what else is here? Toadies, studios, and... Uh... Oh! Oh! Ken! You! Well met! At moonlight. Let us continue as we did last night. Darling. You're dancing as well as ever. I know. But now I must away. Why? I must see the broadcasting under manager. No. Oh, yes. Terry. No, no, I must do it again. Don't open that door. It was the only show I've ever worked on where nobody said quiet. And we would do things like drag a cameraman in front of the camera because it was his birthday. All that indulgent, jolly stuff and custard pies were hurled and... The crews really loved that man. They, they'd do anything for him. It was great. The director doesn't know I'm going to do this. Come with me. Over here. Over here. <laughs> this way. Tragedy <laughs> proven. <laughs> I bet you thought this was the height of glamour, Thames TV, didn't you? Well, look at this. <laughs> Filthy tea towels. <laughs> Daddy old stained drinks. <laughs> Hollywoodsville. Oh. A bit of the old unexpected there. So he would just grab hold of the camera and just take it off any way that he wanted. I mean, he was a director's nightmare and an audience joy. All right. You coped. Wonderful. If you are based in surreal humour and suddenly you want something that inflates, blows up, something that shrivels, you want three of something immediately, you can do that on radio, but suddenly try and do that on television was an impossible task. But Everett explained expanded the skills and techniques of television and it was brilliant to see some of the characters and the things that they did because he asked these brilliant technicians to do the impossible. <laughs> Wilcox, what exactly is it uh, that you do? Well, I sing, mm -hmm. and I act, yes. and I dye my hair. My God! <laughs> How did you do that? Do what? Well, your hair, it keeps changing colour. Oh, really? What colour is it now? Well, it's sort of green, blue, 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 blue red. Ah, well, that means it's Tuesday. <laughs> my God! How did you know that? How embarrassing! <laughs> they queued up. We were the sort of... If I would presume, we were the Eric and Ernie of our day insofar as in the music world, the world of the bands and the groups, uh, they, they loved being on. They all came on to be insulted and hit and drenched. Ladies and gentlemen of video show land, what a star we have for you today. I mean, we've had stars and we've had stars, but this is a star and three quarters. Ladies and gentlemen, that famous bum on legs. <laughs> Hello, Rod. Hi, Tony. <laughs> well, Rod, I've got a favour to ask you. Don't be so filthy. No, I, I, I've always wanted to uh, ask what? you this. Can I touch you? Whereabouts, darling? Just touch you. My mother's not going to put up with this. I don't know about yours. Go on, let me touch you. Whereabouts? <laughs> so I'm supposed to actually look as if I didn't know that was actually going to happen. You know? Anyway, he didn't know that was going to happen either. We felt comfortable with him, and and quite often that's not the case when you do a TV show. You don't feel absolutely at ease in the environment, but because we knew him and we knew that he genuinely liked us. We'd do anything. I mean, why would I string myself up? As ever, we leave you with a cliffhanger. Oh! Shh, shut up! Oh! Shut up! <laughs> this could only have been done on the Kenny Everett show because the other person I suppose I would have done it with would have been Eric Morecambe, the Morecambe and Wise show. Again, they were very lovable characters. They were really wonderful people as well, very nice people to work with. But the obvious thing for me was, and that's what Kenny honed in on, was the fact that my image has always been the nice boy, the, the boy next door, the goody two-shoes of rock and roll. Good morning. What do you want? 
Well, this is a change your image limited, isn't it? Well, what's it got to do with you? Well, I'd like to change my image. Well, don't you stand there. Tell me what you are now. Well, um, I'm Cliff Richard. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I, I know it's got its problems. You see, I'm so nice and I've got these teeth and everything and everybody just loves me. It's just awful. I haven't got an enemy in the world. I bet you're one of these people who goes around smiling and saying, good afternoon and thank you. It's exactly what I do do. You've got to help me. I think I've got just the thing for you. It's somewhere here, yeah. Ah, here we are. Sarcasm for rock stars. This is what you need. You've got to learn to be sarcastic. That sounds great. No, no, you say, that sounds great. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. It's too likable. Not like that. Oh. You're supposed to be rude to me. Make me hate you. Try it again. Well, that sounds uh, great. Oh, that was terrific. Oh, do you think so? Thank you. No, I was being sarcastic. Get it? Oh, were you? No, it's, oh, were you? I'm sorry. Don't ever say sorry. Say, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry? Oh, no. Oh, terrific. Just when I think I'm getting somewhere. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Come on, me. I think he's got it. Great! Some people would have thought that maybe I wouldn't have done it, but for me, it was an obvious thing to do. But probably obvious because it was Kenny again. I could trust him, that I knew that whatever he was doing, it wouldn't be a send up. We'd be all, we'd be laughed with. I wouldn't be laughed at. Uh, quite a lot of the TV stuff that you see now, comedy wise, uh, people have laughs at your expense. And from the bits that I.